right, so today we have a really special guest with us. We have Dr. Angelo Tellington, um, who is a British Horse Society Fellow, Assistant Professor at Equine Science at Delaware Valley University, and a board member for the International Society of Equitation Science. Angelo specializes in the application of learning psychology to horse training and has earned his PhD in equine behavior and training. In addition to his academic, academic achievements, Angelo is an accomplished writer in both horse uh, show jumping and dressage, earning many championships himself and in, with his students. He now coaches writers of all levels. Um, and also uh, recently, Angelo is best known for his bridalist writing at local shows and events. So thank you so much, Dr. Tellington, for joining us today. Thank you to you, Angelo is fine. I feel old, doctor. <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, I'm so glad you could join us today and uh, just spend a little time. You've such a, a extensive background, so I really appreciate you sharing some of your knowledge with us. Um, so right now, it sounds like you're just starting the school year with your students. Is that about right? No, no. We have, uh, we are still on break. Uh, okay. This school will start the middle of August. So right now we are like helping all, all our school horses that we love them and, and they're like fantastic as a teacher. So yeah. we're, giving, we're giving them a summer off. We are reschooling some of them. We're getting new vision that needs to settle in. So we're preparing everything for the students to arrive. Oh, I see. Okay, so you're just getting everything situated. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, um, so with your background, I would love to hear um, just a little bit, um, maybe you can help us just telling us a little bit about horse psychology that some of us might not know about. Um, just generally like some tips that people might not know about psychology for horses. Well, there are so many things I wouldn't even know where to start. I think the one thing that um, I always remind uh, my students or when I do clinic around the world, is that horses thinks about statistics so they count the numbers of behaviors and we think instead about timing so i'll give you an example if we're doing a training session and we think that the horse is challenging us or is not doing what we're asking um, that's another issue that we're going to discuss later the horses never challenge us they just pick up wrong cues from us but let's let's not put too many things on the same uh, at the same time. So what we think, for example, let's say that the horse doesn't want to turn left. And so we fight, 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 pressure release, pressure release, and try to get him to turn left in the least amount of time possible. And we feel happy. Let's say the horse um, disobeyed three times, five times, and then uh, gave up and go left right at the fifth time. <laughs> But let's say in three minutes, two minutes, we're all happy because we think that uh, we fix the problem in a very little time. Other scenarios, instead, we ask one time and we hold the, the um, pressures and we just wait. And then maybe that horse, it takes that horse like 20 minutes, 30 minutes to turn and go the direction that we're asking. Mm -hmm. In our brain, we think, oh, he must have, like he won the session because he resisted me for 20 minutes. Um, in, in horses mentality, instead, it's the opposite. Uh, the first horse will remember, oh good, on, on five attempts, I won four, he, <laughs> I gave up one. Uh, the other horse will just remember the day after because they don't reason with the time. The, the other horse, the day after, will just remember, oh shoot, I had to give up 100% of the time he asked me something. So the day after, a first horse will always, always go through that minute of testing. The other horse will eventually quit. So when you go to a horse show, uh, then, and you don't have like time because the first one is the good one, otherwise you, you are eliminated, uh, the first horse, if he feels uncomfortable, will pull out a trick. The second horse will, will, will not pull out because for the second horse, he had always to listen 100% of the time that something was asked. Wow, that's really interesting. So statistics, I had no idea. Yeah. <laughs> Just the numbers. 
So that's really cool. So that's a really good example. Um, yeah, I don't think many people knew that. Um, I know timing is a huge part in training, like for cues and things like that. Yeah. Do you mind going into a little detail on, um, yeah, timing related to training? I actually, I've actually done a study on, uh, I hate when people use the whip uh, to punish horses because we use the whip uh, with gentle tapping to encourage the horse to give us behavior. So if we use it to punish, we kind of like um, ruin the, all, the a good communication tool that we had. But um, I, for example, I, I'll, I'll see if I, my head, I can see my head. So when we use the whip, normally the majority of people use the whip with the reloading time of the arm, okay? Uh -huh. Yeah. So, yeah. So now, um, because the release of the pressure is the one that tells the horse, good boy, do it again, mm -hmm. and it's immediately connected to the behavior, I'll try to, to do it. So if I back, 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 and the person is whipping, trying to punish the back because back, back, but if you watch my hand, is back release, back release, back release, back release. So I'm actually telling the horse, good boy, I want you to keep Just bucking. <laughs> exactly. Oh. So instead, instead, what you need to do as far as timing, for example, you just gentle tap and the horse is gonna do back, 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 forward, and then you stop. Uh, because it can't, the tapping will not really reward the back because the back is happening. So back, 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 forward, release. The okay. other way, back, release, back, release, back, release. I can still reward the horse without knowing it. I'm okay. rewarding the horse. So you're saying, I'm just trying to gather what you're saying here. You're, you would tap like quicker than the buck is happening because they're- Yes, correct. So you tap below a second, so it's this. Okay. So the, the, any behavior that the horse is trying to test to see which one release the tapping doesn't have the release because the tapping is happening faster than the behavior. And then as soon as the behavior, the horses go forward, then you stop and then the horse understand, oh, that's what you want. Um, in, instead, even uh, from a second or above, there isn't enough uh, releasing time in between the two top that the horse can produce a full behavior and be rewarded. Interesting. So, and they, they take into account the timing too of, you said like you have the whip and then it's just the timing between and it. And that's yeah. enough for them to real, like to correlate. It's, the timing. it's enough to perceive that one as a release. Interesting. Which means good boy, do it again. Wow. Yeah, as a release. Okay. Wow. Yeah. That's so that's really interesting too. Um, just from my my background, I, I know um usually if they're bucking, you just help push them forward. Um just yeah. forward motion. Um, but I see what yeah, I see what you're saying, like people do with the whip and they're like bad. <laughs> it's like just yeah. stop. But you're saying like you would just go even with the leg, if you, some people some people does the same thing, the horse back and they kick, the horse back and they kick, the horse back, yeah. but then the same thing. It's pressure release, pressure release. So it's pressure back release, pressure back release. So even with the leg, you either hold them back, 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 forward release, uh -huh. or back you you tap. Faster. Back Back, 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 forward, release. This one, again, it's back, release, back, release. So I'm actually rewarding the horse yeah. for backing. So whenever, this is a suggestion, whenever you have a horse that you think is challenging you, it's like using an avoidance behavior to not work, uh, do not think that is doing it against you because I always say is there are 1200 pounds if they want to do something against us we are dead um, the horse is just picking up a, a behavior that is thinking that we're actually asking just change the sequence in which you use your aids pay attention where the pressure and release are and you'll have happy horses that understand and then just do what you're asking yeah yeah absolutely and then um, just this is comes to my mind when you're saying with the like uh, the whip or you know inside of cue and aid, 
Um, some horses are a little bit more dull to a, a, like just to say the background of the horse, they've been accustomed to it before and they're dulled to the whip. How can you get them more sensitized to, to you know, to react um, accordingly without, you know, you're just yeah. like, you're no, it's, them to do something. Yeah, it's it's the same thing. Like probably what happened is we overuse the whip. So I always say we have two types of horses. We normally overuse the stimulus and we never release the right behavior. Mm -hmm. So we have two types of horses. We have the great, what we call them school horses, that what they do is they ignore. They're like, okay, this stimulus is like a background stimulus. I'll ignore it and I don't even pay attention to it, and I become dull to it, and I just either pick up other cues or stop doing whatever I want to do because it doesn't make sense to me. Right. And then you have this instead the, the competitor mentality, which instead is like wants to do good, and it's like, okay, what do you want, what do you want, what do you want, do you want, you keep asking, you keep asking, you keep asking, and then they pick up a fight or flight behavior, and then let's say they rear, and, and then what do we do when they rear? We drop the pressure and we hold them around. So we release everything. So they're like, oh, you should have told me before that you won the rear. There you go. I got it. I got it. I got you. I got you. So whenever we apply pressure, boom, they go up in the air. Um, and, and so with that doll horse, uh, what we need to do is we need to restart again and just put a tapping maybe from the ground so we can help him to move and understand when the release is. And so we go soft, strong, and then quick release as soon as he moves. Soft, strong, quick release when he moves. And then he's like, oh, okay, I got it. And then they just... Back. Okay, he comes back into, uh, it's no, no longer white noise to them. It's just, yeah. oh, you, you're trying to say something to me. <laughs> Yeah, okay. exactly. Try to say, and I, I got it. I now, now, but then we need to be consistent because if we keep using it random again, even if it's strong, it doesn't. It they just okay. don't pick it up. Interesting. Wow. Okay. So that's a great tip too. So just to get a duller horse more um, receptive to an aid. So that's a good one too. Um, and so I know, for example, like spurs. A lot. Some people don't use spurs, and some people do. Um, what is your feeling like how to use a spur? Okay, so let's open a chapter uh, bigger than this one. Okay. okay. So it's uh, horses wants predictability and controllability of the stimulus. A horses and even us, human and every animal. So they've done a study in, in, um, in rats, they put three rats on three metal cages. One was without electricity, the other two with electricity. One of the other two had a light before the electricity goes on, and then the lever that the rat could pull to stop the electricity. When it was stopping, when it was stopping the electricity, it would stop both the electricity on both rat cages. So the amount of electricity that the two rats were having was identical. Now, we are expecting that the two rats that were having the electricity would be stressed almost at the same level, and the rat that didn't have electricity would be not stressed. In reality, the rat that could predict the electricity coming and control the electricity by doing a behavior was actually not stressed as the rat that didn't receive electricity. So instead, the rat that they couldn't control and didn't know that it was coming was completely freaking out. So spurs is the sex spurs, no spurs. If the spurs, if I if I ask the horse predictability, turn left with the with the cue, and then the horse is turning left, and so he can control the pressure of the spur that is not coming, that horse is gonna be happy. If I keep kicking the spurs and there's no prediction and there is no uh, controllability, because, uh, then the horse gets stressed. But it would get stressed even if I use my leg without spurs in that way. So even bit, a, a softer bit that keeps um, making confusion in the horse's mouth, sometimes for the horse, it's psychologically and physically more har harsh than a stronger bit but with a, with a steady hand that let the horse to predict and, and uh, control. 
Okay. Yeah. That that's really good to break it down like that. What an interesting study though. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> what they did back back on the days, what they did yeah. to those rats <laughs> where it was I'm not sure. I think it, it would pass. Now we have, uh, every time we do an experiment, a behavioral experiment, we have to have to approve it by uh, the ethical uh, committee. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, to approve an experiment like that, we, you need to justify really, really that. You are looking yeah, for something to, yeah, well. to improve the welfare. <laughs> you sacrifice the welfare of one to improve the welfare of many. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I hear you. Um, but yeah, so for spurs, um, I just, I've heard that too. It's just, it's how you're using it. It's an aid. And if you're using any aid incorrectly, then it's going to cause harm. But if yeah. you use it correctly, mm -hmm. um, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just to help, an, a, yeah, extension of your leg. Um, so that's, yeah, okay. That makes sense. Then. Um, one of my questions that I had is um, just from your experience and your findings too, what would you say is the most optimal amount of time for a training session with a horse for them to really just obtain the most from that session? I imagine that might affect the, between like the age of the horse, but just generally, it's just say it's a horse that in competition, um, what would you say is the um, optimal amount of time for them? It's a complicated question. Um, and let's again not answer the question. That's typical of me, but make another a different reasoning. Okay, so we know that the horses are very, very good in uh, learn. It's shaping this. They are very, very good in learning a small approximation. They're very fast. Um, so. Uh, as long as we, and it takes them like very little time, like almost a second, a minute to, sh to shape a behavior properly. So whenever we start the training session, we need to keep that in mind that we start our warm up where we're not asking anything new. We get the horse all ready and then each horse is different. Every day it's different. So if he's a little more excited we need to reach an optimal le level of psychological and physical so we might spend five minutes ten minutes it depends the horse will tell us that day how much it wanted like keep going until he relaxed okay. so let's say we're done we are done with the warm-up and now we are moving into the new things um i all uh, we know that the horse is pretty fast so I always, when I do clinic, I show them that I can shape a targeting behavior in less than two minutes, three minutes. And I've done a lot of, for example, ex, uh, sh, uh, demo with horses that don't want to get injections and like people with twitch, three people folding, and it takes forever. Usually in a minute, a minute and a half, I can have a horse stand still with no rest restraint and accepting the injection. So having that time in mind, when you start the new things under saddle, you have to have that one in your mind. So you have to break down the exercise and make it so simple that the horse just pick it up right away. At that point, you can go and repeat it as many times as you want to because the horse understood what you're asking and, and is fine with it. Um, if instead, if instead, and then I usually, once once I've done like five, 10 minutes, five of this repetition, I just let it go. Mm -hmm. And then I do my like uh, the closing of the training session by going around, mm -hmm. except walking. Et um, that, that's the amount. If okay. we start going, if we start going like 10, 15, 20 minutes on one, like the flying, teaching the flying change, for example, mm -hmm. and it's not working, it's not gonna work. Einstein always told, remind, remind us that doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different result, it's the definition of insanity. Yeah. So, so for example, flying change. I start the flying change, it's not working, so I don't insist because I make the horse more and I just go back and I break it down. So I put a pole on the diagonal, I canter through the pole, I push forward, I don't even ask the flying change, that, um, and then because the air time on the pole increased, the horse has the chance to switch the hind leg. It sees the corner, so naturally he wants to flying change uh, to exit 
properly. And so there you go in like less than 30 seconds, I have my flying change. And then from there, I keep my exercises. So one time I go on the pole, one time I don't, one time I go, one time I don't. And then if the horse picks up the flying change on the same spot, but close to the pole, then I ask it before the pole. And then usually with this session, I have the flying change in flight in five minutes. If I don't, that means that something is wrong. I should quit and rearrange my whole exercise. I see. So it's from what you're asking them. It's, um, it's yeah, it, they're very fast learning. If something is not happening right, like in within two minutes, uh, it's not going to happen. You need to change something. Reevaluate how you're asking. Yeah. And where's the problem? Where, wh why is he not capable of doing it? And adjusting it based on that situation and the horse. And they are, that's the, where the experience comes in. Okay. And then just on that topic too, though, um, so and some athletic ability would probably come into play too, um, say for a jump or something like that, where it's, it takes a lot of um, work to do. Um, how would you help a horse that's just not confident in that sense. Like you're asking them and you're doing the cues correctly and you're just trying to build their confidence. Yeah, if the horse is not confident, that means that I made a mistake during the bringing up because I should never overface a horse to make him unconfident. I should always wait for him to investigate, to learn that all jumps are the same and then uh, give him enough balance um, that he can do what I'm asking. So now I made a mistake. I overfaced the horse to a bigger jump. He lost confidence. So I need to go back and give him back that confidence. And usually the best way to do it is uh, through sequence of in and out that prepare the horse to a better, the perfect balance. So then you can jump a little bit bigger. And then once you jump back to a lower height, the horse knows that it can jump bigger in his head. And then it feels more confident. Or there is an exercise that I love dearly, which is a trot ball exercise that I actually may give you the link uh, as a free gift for the audience. Mm -hmm. And you can follow that sequence. It's, it's a trot exercise. So the horse comes at a trot and has the time mm -hmm. to find its own balance and has the time actually to break down the jumps in all three phases, take off, flying and landing. And because it's repetitive, it, the horse can, uh, every time that he comes back, experiment a new behavior and new balance and feel more confident that he can do it. And then the horse is the same thing. It, it will remember saying in, in like simple word, it will remember that if he could jump at a trot, a big fence, at a canter is gonna be easier. Easier, oh, I see. Yeah, that'd be great if you could share that with us um, as a gift and I can put the link next to the video um, that would be really helpful for people, I think, too. So thank you. So, um, yeah, other questions I have for you, too. Um, just, well, this is something that I, I think maybe you can answer. Um, so from a person who's in competition, but they want to step it up to the next level, say it's amateur level, and they want to go pro or something like that, what, what does it take to really um, go from just amateur to pro? Um, in that state, that makes sense. Um, the, the biggest um, um, difference, I wouldn't say that there is a difference. Uh, the biggest difference is that you make money with the, with the horses rather than spending money with the horses. Uh, yeah. Although, <laughs> although with horses, you always spend money. Uh, there is a saying, uh, you know how to make a million dollar uh, with horses? Uh, what? So, uh, yeah, you start with two. Start with two million. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but um, yeah, the the probably the the biggest difference is that um, um, having a little bit more time to dedicate to horses, it give you that uh, um, base of uh, um, like reflex experience and. Uh, and uh, memories that will allow you to uh, find a quicker solution uh, in, 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 any, in any situation. Um, an amateur usually have a little less time 
um, to dedicate, so the number of experiences is, uh, is it's lower. As far as uh, sensitivity, uh, uh, feeling, um, the, another tip that I always say is usually to a pro, we say that they have kind of a horse instinct, uh, more mm -hmm. developed than an amateur, uh, but, mm -hmm. but uh, feeling and instinct actually can be trained. Uh, and there are and, and there are a, a, a series of exercises that you can do to train your body and your muscle memory. Mm -hmm. So the, the most important things that uh, a pro has well developed along a good serious, serious muscle memory that he can use in any session, mm -hmm. and that's what we call horse sense. So muscle memories, if you know what you're doing, you can actually train them and develop them. Uh, and develop them. There's a lot of exercises that I actually had codified, etc. And normally they're all kinesthetic exercises. We are our kinesthetic learner on horses. And so t telling, talking, and sometimes even showing will work. Uh, but if you go to a trainer that has a lot of um, um, like tools in, in, in the regard of uh, kinesthetic exercise, almost every amateur can be turned into a pro. And that's what I do when I do clinic around the world. I see, so you just help them with muscle memory and- just... Yes, there are tons, and, and on the link that I'm gonna show you, uh, the, it, it is mentioned uh, also how to build muscle memories to the rider to improve uh, ability on jumping and other stuff. Oh, awesome. Yeah, that'll be really beneficial, I think. Um, so I, did, I didn't know that, I didn't know, um, it's just something like that, that will be the difference between amateur and pro status. So, um, and then just on that topic too, so it sounds like it's a lot of just the rider um, of learning muscle memory, but for the horse, just to say you have a great horse and you're amateur and you're taking them pro, how much time, just average I would say, are they spending actually riding per day? Um, is it like an hour, uh, a minute, I, you know? Yeah. Like, believe it or not, if you follow my, like, I have a, a, a philosophy that I don't make the horses do stuff. So you can have a horse that do a flying change because mechanically you bend him and you make him do it, or you can just behaviorally teaching the horse to do a flying change. And once a horse has learned a behavior, it's learned forever. So I actually don't spend a lot of time, like, training because once they learn they learn i spend a lot of, a lot of time to doing fun things getting off the stalls going for a trail ride doing a canter uphill do some fun stuff then we go back into the arena we do just a gymnastic and then we just go to a horse show and we have fun at the horse show too so because there i'm always asking what he has learned already so um i would say that the time that we spend is a generic healthy time that a horse should spend outside of the stall to match his walking and match his uh, like looking around and, and not being bored. I see. I see. So just keeping them engaged and just yeah. having fun, keeping them yeah. um, interested in the sport. So, wow, that's a really good tip too. So, um, yeah, we are coming uh, to the end of our um, time. So I, I really do appreciate your time with us. Um, those are some great tips. I think that people will really appreciate um, the link, especially too, just with your exercises and just the psychology. I think it's so beneficial for people to understand how horses think um, and how you can help them, yeah, just be a better team together. You can understand how they work and how you can help show them what you're wanting. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me here. Awesome. And uh, if the audience have any questions, I normally, I'm, I'm happy to give feedback. So through the social media or something, if you wanna just shoot uh, any questions, um, I'll be happy to help and answer um, if you have a, a request. Sure, and so you guys, yeah, just look, I guess, for Facebook for Angelo Tellington. Again. Yeah, Facebook, or, or if you, the link is on my YouTube channel, and then, or you just Google my name, and uh, the links of emails will come out. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much, and we'll thank talk you. again.